pride and self-reliance keep us from seeking God's help and guidance. There's very little room for God to work when we are full of ourselves. Think about that. There's very little room for God to do things in our lives when we are full of ourselves. The Bible calls us to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand so that he may lift us up at the appointed time. See 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. A true event happened a number of years ago. The title of my message today is Seven Ways We Limit God's Power in Our Lives. Seven Ways We Limit God's Power in Our Lives. The King of England is a big figure, a, sp a prestigious figure. He looms larger than life. He even has his own palace. You know, since I'm married to a British lady, I am learning a lot about British culture. There's only one problem with the King of England. He has no power. He looks good. He looks like one of the most powerful people in the world. But he cannot vote. And the King of England cannot veto, meaning he cannot prevent a law from being passed. His position in his country is one of courtesy. The king of England doesn't really have any real power to do anything. What England does to the king, we do to the king of kings. We give him verbal recognition. We encase him in beautiful palaces and churches. We confine God and his power to the church building only. We've got people coming to pay homage to him as they pay recognition and homage to the king of England. But when it comes to decision making, to veto power, and to voting, we don't need him. We need God in church. We need God when we're among Christians. But when we're out in the world, living for ourselves, many of us don't want God in that as well. We don't want God to have any power in our lives outside of church. We acknowledge his position without giving him the credit or the power that accompanies it. So many of us treat the King of Kings the way the British people treat the King of England. He is someone we recognize, but he doesn't have real power to change anything in our lives. In Joshua 24, Joshua spoke about drying up the, God, God drying up the Red Sea so that people would cross, would cross on dry ground. And he said in Joshua chapter 4, verse 24, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that he may fear the Lord, that they may fear the Lord God forever. Now, I'm not trying to get political now, but there's elections going on in the United States. I'm not getting political. I'm just using this as an illustration. There's a unique position that America is in. Both people who are running for presidency, they've both been in power. Kamala Harris as vice president and President Trump as the former president. They both have a record that they could use, what they did with power or what they failed to do with power. They both have a record that they can launch off of. And in the same way, God has a record. That record is throughout the word of God. We've seen God and his power in action. So we should never limit him. Because we've seen him in action. We've seen his record. We've seen him in, in his performance. Job spoke about God's power in Job 12, 13. With him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. And Paul said it very well in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 4, 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Okay, the kingdom of God is not bark with no bite. We have three dogs at home. Two of them are big, full-size dogs, and we have one midget dog. We call her Belle, okay? She is the size of a puppy, but that's the maximum size she's going to grow to for her entire life. The other two dogs are normal size. Belle is a bit of a midget dog. She's very small. But what she lacks in size, she makes up for in attitude, okay? She barks and barks more than the other dogs. And she's always fighting with the other dogs, even though she is small. Even though the other dogs are much bigger than her and are much stronger than her and can do serious damage to her, 
She still fights with them. She has a bit of a Napoleonic complex. Okay, Napoleonic complex. Remember Napoleon, the general Napoleon. He was a short man, although historians um, are arguing. They say that he was about average height. But many people believe he was small and he was feeling inferior. So to make up for his feelings of being small, he waged a war throughout Europe. So this dog, Belle, she has a bit of a Napoleonic complex. She is small, but she acts like she's big. She makes a lot of noise, but cannot really perform. Okay? God is not like that, as we hear in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the, let me read it again. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. God is not just making a lot of noise. He has the power to back up everything. He's not a God of words only, but he is a God of true, real power. We know that God is omnipotent, meaning having virtually unlimited authority or influence. We also know that God is omniscient. Having infinite awareness, understanding, and insight. And third, we also know that God is omnipresent. Present in all places at all times. I have those three words and their definition on the projector right now. This is why it's important to take notes. These are things that you want to know. Things you want to understand about God. Omnipotent. Having virtually unlimited authority or influence. Omniscient having infinite awareness and understanding and insight and omnipresent, present in all places at all times. You know, God is outside of the human experience. He, for 33 years, God became man in Jesus Christ to be the sacrifice for our sins. But God now is beyond the human experience. And he is calling the shots. He is in control. You want a God like that. You don't want a God that is at the same level as you. You want a God that is outside of you and outside of your experience calling the shots. When I work out, I, I like, when I go to the gym, I, I, I hit the heavy bag boxing and I jump rope and I walk and sometimes swim. I like to work out by myself, okay? I don't like to work out with other people because other people make fun of my routines. My routine and workout works for me, but other people like to make fun of me, okay, and my routine. But I'm just working out for myself to try to stay in shape, to have energy. But if I was training for a game, uh, training for a football game, or training for a boxing match or something like that, if I really wanted to be serious about my exercise, I wouldn't do it by myself. I would want a coach. I would want a standard setting person outside of me. Someone watching me because you know when I'm doing jump rope, sometimes I get tired and sometimes I skip numbers. I go to 30, 49, 50 and I go all the way to 70 and I miss 60 because the mind is tired. That's if I'm by myself. But I, if I'm serious about working out, if I'm serious about, you know, participating in a sport, I would want a coach, a standard setter outside of me, watching me and keeping track and making sure I was doing the exercise properly. And God is the standard setter outside of us. He is not on the same level as we are. Buddha was a human being like you and me. Same level as we are. Muhammad was a human being like you and me. Confucius, a human being like you and me. All of these other religious founders, they were like you and me. They were within the same limitations that you and I are in. The God of the Bible is not like that. He is a standard setter. He is someone who watches who is outside of us. You don't want a God that is on the same level as you. You want a God that is beyond you but still loves you. Now the last one, God is omnipresent, present in all places at all time. At this point, I can imagine a smart Alex saying, oh, so do you mean God is in hell? Well, he, God is not in hell proper, okay? Hell is the absence of God's presence. He's not in hell proper, but Pastor Ricky, what about what David says in Psalms 139 verse 8, that when he makes his bed in hell, behold, you are there. David is not referring to hell proper. He's referring to Shiloh, 
the region of the unseen and the unknown. No matter where you are, he is there. The only place God is not is in hell proper. Believe me, you don't want to go there to find out what it's like to be outside of the presence of God. Okay? So the hell that David is speaking about in Psalms 139, verse 8, is different than hell proper. That's just something I wanted to inject there if there's any confusion. So, is it possible that we, his people, the sheep of his, the sheep of, and God is the shepherd, is it possible to limit God's power in our lives? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to limit God's power in our lives? The short answer is yes, which seems not right. What, what do you mean limiting God's power? The fact that he is God means that his power is limitless and the fact that he is God transcends the limitations that bind us in the human experience. But let me just say something that I'm going to try to repeat a number of times in this message. When I talk about limiting God's power, I'm not saying that God's power can be limited as it is. What I am saying that the effectiveness of that power can be limited in our lives and cause the good things that God wants to happen in our lives from not happening. So we cannot limit God's power. We cannot bind God, okay? We cannot put ropes around him and refuse him from moving. We cannot limit his power as is, but we can limit the effectiveness of that power in our lives when we do some of the things that I'm going to be talking about in this message today. So I want this to be understood. You cannot limit God. You cannot restrain his power, but you can limit the effectiveness of that power in your life by doing the things that we're going to be talking about. The Bible does, however, give numerous instances in which human actions, attitudes, and unbelief can restrict the manifestation of God's power and blessings in people's lives. So again, you cannot limit God, but you can limit his effectiveness in your life. You cannot limit his power, but you can limit how effective his power is in your life. With number one, unbelief and doubt. You can limit God's power in your life when you live in unbelief and doubt. An aunt and uncle had a missionary family visiting their home. When the missionary children were called in for dinner, their mother said, be sure to wash your hands. The little boy scowled and said, germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus. That's all I hear and I've never seen either one of them. Germs and Jesus. He, got, he didn't want to, to wash his hands. He sounds like my son who also doesn't like to wash his hands. Because germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus. I hear about them, but I never see them. Just because you can't see them does not mean that they are not there. Just because you cannot see them does not mean they cannot have an effect on your life. Germs and Jesus. Responding to them appropriately is the wisest thing that you can do. Responding to germs appropriately by washing your hands. Responding to Jesus appropriately by recognizing you are a sinner before holy God. Repenting of that sin and putting your full trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. One of the most direct ways in which we limit God is through unbelief and doubt. The Bible provides several examples where unbelief prevented people from fully experiencing God's miracles and blessings. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 58, the Bible says that Jesus did not perform many miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. Remember, Jesus went to his home village and they wanted to kill him because he said the scriptures were fulfilled before them, that he was the promised Messiah. The people of Nazareth, who were familiar with Jesus' background, doubted his divinity and thus limited their own experience of his miraculous power. The people in Jesus' home village were familiar with him. I've been working as a pastor in this school for a long time, and I've seen the same cycle take place again and again. In first term, people are fresh. People are obedient. Students are well-behaved. We don't know who they really are in the first term. They're wearing a mask. Second term, we get to see more of people's character because people are becoming more comfortable. Third term, people are very familiar. There is no hiding in this term. We see who you really are. 
In third term, the mask is removed and we see your true character. I've been doing this job a long time and I see it happen every single time during this third term. Jesus was unable to do miraculous acts in his home village because the people were familiar. Are you going to make it difficult to teach you academically or spiritually? Are you going to make it difficult to teach you because you are familiar? Familiarity keeps God from doing what he wants to do in people's lives. If you are over familiar with God, if you're over familiar with him and you lose sight of reverence for him, I'm, saying you, I'm not saying you can't get closer to God. Of course, get closer to God. But don't get so over-familiar with him that you lose appreciation of him. You lose reverence of him. Because when you do, he won't be able to do miraculous things in your life when you're over-familiar with him. But their skepticism acted as a barrier preventing them from fully benefiting from Jesus' ministry. He could not do anything in his hometown because of the familiarity. And then there was the Israelites' journey through the wilderness. It's another example of how unbelief can limit people from fully experiencing God's power in their lives. In Psalms 78 verse 41, the psalmist reflects on Israel's repeated failure to trust God by saying, Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Again, the limitation was not on God's power. The limitation was on the effectiveness of that power in their life, in their lives. His power was limited in their lives because of their unbelief and doubt. Despite witnessing numerous miracles, such as the parting of the Red Sea and the provision of manna, the Israelites repeatedly doubted God's ability to provide and protect. Their lack of faith led to a prolonged journey and missed opportunities to enter the promised land. Because of their doubt, because of their disbelief, the original Jews to come out of Egypt never went into the promised land. They all died in the wilderness, and it was their children that went into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Because of their doubt, because of their unbelief, a trip that should have taken a few weeks became 40 years. Because of their doubt and unbelief, there was a freshness when they were in Egypt. Like I said, there was a freshness in first term. They weren't familiar with God when they were slaves, but they got familiar with God when they were in the wilderness. Despite seeing the miraculous, despite seeing all of the things that God did for them, they became familiar with God. This is one of the reasons faith has to be built on something stronger than miracles. Your faith has to be built on Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Unbelief and doubt do not diminish God's power, but they do affect how that power is manifested in our lives. When we doubt God, we are essentially closing the door on his ability to work fully in our circumstances. Faith, on the other hand, is the key that unlocks the door to God's limitless potential. How many have heard of the movie star Brad Pitt? Or maybe you've seen one of his movies. How many of you know the movie star Brad Pitt? Okay. Brad Pitt is a very big, big movie star in Hollywood. He's won the highest award that could be won, an Oscar. And he had a Christian upbringing. He had a Christian upbringing that he has run away from. He's run away from Christ. And there was an interview with him in a magazine called Rolling Stone. And the interviewer's name was Chris Heath. And he discusses religion with Brad Pitt. And this is how the article went. There is one subject that he refers to time and time again. And that is religion. This is Brad Pitt. I would call it oppression. That's what Brad Pitt calls religion. Oppression. Because it stifles or brings down any kind of personal individual freedom. I dealt with a lot of that, and my family would diametrically disagree with me on all of that. The interviewer went on to say, it's only when we later drift into an unlikely debate about one of the New Testament parables that I realized just how different a kind of God Pitt grew up with. To him, to Brad Pitt, the parable of the prodigal son is an authoritarian tale told to keep people in line, to control people. 
This, he explains, is a story which says if you go out and try to find your own voice and find what works for you and what makes sense to you, then you're going to be destroyed and you will be humbled and you will not be alive again until you come home to the Father's ways. That's what Brad Pitt thinks the message of the prodigal son is. Killing your individual dreams and aspirations. There are people who can be limiting God's power in their life based on an incorrect and faulty understanding of God and his word. There are some people who do not know the God of the Bible. They don't know the true God. They know a false Jesus, a false God that has been created by man. And because they have an incorrect understanding of the true God, they have doubt. And that doubt is limiting the true God from working in their lives. Remember, Jesus told parables to conceal and to reveal heavenly truth. He told parables to hide the truth of the kingdom from those who would not appreciate it. The religious leaders and the people who wanted to catch Jesus in what he said. But he told parables to reveal heavenly truth to those who had the right heart. To those who truly wanted to learn. The disciples and those who had right motives. And the story of the prodigal son illustrates the immediate acceptance of a sinner who turns to God. That's the true message of the story of the prodigal son. Number two, disobedience and rebellion can limit God's power in your life. Disobedience and rebellion. Another significant way we limit God is through disobedience to his commands and rebellion fighting against his lead in of our lives. The Bible constantly shows that obedience to God's commandments opens the door to his blessings, while disobedience closes the door. King Saul is a prime example of someone who limited God's plan in his life through disobedience. In 1 Samuel 15, sorry, in 1 Samuel 15, Saul disobeyed God's command to destroy the Amalekites. And, their, and destroy their possessions. Instead, he spares the king and the best of the livestock. As a result, God rejects Saul as king, saying through the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Now, in other situations, the children of Israel were allowed to plunder the treasure from a conquered enemy. In this situation, they were not allowed. It wasn't about the treasures. Just like with Eve, it wasn't about the fruit. It was about obedience to God's command concerning the treasure, concerning the fruit. Don't get caught up in the, in the, in the actual thing. Get caught up in what God said. It was about disobedience to God's commands. Saul's rebellion limited not only his own potential, but also affected the nation of Israel. Something you have to understand, if you are hard-headed, if you are rebellious, if you don't want to listen, if you want to do things your own way, it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect other people as well. The story of Jonah also illustrates the limiting power of disobedience. When God commands Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach repentance, Jonah flees in the opposite direction. His disobedience not only jeopardized his own life, but also the lives of the sailors whom he was traveling with. Your rebellion does not just affect you. It also affects the people around you. Disobedience can manifest in many forms, whether through outright rebellion against God's commands or through small compromises. No, in, in, in our daily lives. Each act of disobedience, no matter how small, can limit the ways in which God works through us and in us. But when we choose to obey God, even in difficult circumstances, we allow God to fully express his will in our lives. Saul died by committing suicide. We don't know what happened to Jonah. Yes, he was forced back into obedience, but their stories could have ended differently if they did not rebel. Who knows how much more God could have done in them and through them if they were not in rebellion. There is a French philosopher who died by the name of Voltaire. He was a pagan who cursed God. He believed that there, is no, that there was no God. He believed that thinking about God was an exercise for people of low intellectual ability. 
Voltaire ridiculed the thought of God. But then as he goes, as it goes for all men, it came time for him to die. He lay there on his deathbed desperately in need of God. He screamed and hollered. In fact, Voltaire's nurse recorded, is recorded as saying that she never wanted to see another man die like Voltaire did because this man died in agony, foaming at the mouth with hell looming before his eyes. Here was a man who cursed God and God's word. Now, if you go over to his house today, it has been turned into a Bible factory where Bibles are made and distributed around the world. God can take people who curse him and use their place, their home, to curse him, and he can use their place to write the word of God to have it distributed to people. He is a God who can take evil and make it turn around for good. What the enemy meant for evil, God can use for good. God could take men, he could use men, the men who condemned him to death, to bring salvation to us. He can allow sinful men to put him on the cross so that you and I might be redeemed. So don't get upset because evil men are doing evil things. Just tell your king to use his power to take their evil for your good. That's the kind of God that we have. A God that can turn things around. What the enemy meant for evil, God can use for good. My disobedience, another person's disobedience and rebellion against God, God can use that to get glory for himself. The third thing that we can do to limit God's power in our life is to be filled with fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety, being filled with it, can limit God's power in our lives. Fear and anxiety are emotions that can significantly limit our experience of God's peace and provision. The Bible encourages believers to trust in God and not be afraid. Yet fear often hinders us from stepping into God's promises. I've seen this in my life as well. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, Jesus tells the parable of the talents, where a servant who received one talent buries it out of fear of losing it. When the master returns, he is disciplined. The servant, he disciplines the servant for his lack of faith. The servant's fear limited his potential to grow and multiply what was given to him. This parable notes the ways in which fear can paralyze us, leading to missed opportunities to partner with God and his work. Um, this last holiday, we had the first term of our new class of Kindle College students, pastors and church leaders from all over the country who come for teaching here, advanced Bible training. And I remember when, I, when past, the late Pastor Ron, a friend of this ministry, the man who authored the whole of Kindle College, I remember when he was giving me the responsibility to be in charge of this Bible training program. Let me tell you, there was fear in me. I felt so unqualified. At some point, I thought about saying, no, I am the wrong person. This is not for me. I cannot lead this. I felt it was a great, a too big of a responsibility for me to carry. And believe me, I've made mistakes along the way, mistakes that I've tried to learn from, but I've also seen God do great things through Kindle College. In this last Kindle College class, there was a woman who told my wife, she hopes that nobody was seeing, but as we were reading the Kindle College information, that just gives you a deeper understanding of God, a deeper understanding of the way God wants you to live. She started crying as we were going through the information. She hoped no one could see it. But if I allowed fear to, get, to say, okay, I don't want to be a part of this, I, could not, I would not have been a part of that. I would not have been a part of what God wanted to do through Kindle College if I let fear take over. He would have found someone else. He would have found someone else if I said, no, out of fear, I don't want to do this. How many great things is God willing to do through you and for you if you step out of fear into confidence? If you step out of fear into his promises? If you step out of anxiety into the knowledge that you serve a mighty God who can do mighty things through willing vessels? 
There are so many things that fear can prevent you from being a part of. Fear and anxiety can limit God's power in your life. Another illustration of how fear limits God's work is seen in the account of Peter walking on water in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 23. When Peter initially steps out of the boat, his eyes are fixed on Jesus, and he does the impossible, the miraculous, by walking on water. But when he shifts his focus to the wind and the waves, he's overcome by his fears, and he begins to sink. And then Jesus said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter's fears interrupted what could have been a miraculous demonstration of faith. Again, who knows how many more steps Peter could have made if he didn't give in to doubt, if he didn't give in to fear. Fear and anxiety can limit our ability to trust in God's provision and protection. They can cause us to rely on our own understandings rather than on God's promises. The Bible encourages us to cast our anxiety on God because he cares for us in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7 and to trust his perfect love that casts out all fear in 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 how many of you have been paralyzed because of fear kept from doing everything or the great things that God wanted to do in you and through you don't let fear paralyze you Walk in the power that God has available to you if you are willing to be used by him. The fourth thing that can limit God's power in our life is pride and self-reliance. How many of you know someone who is proud? Someone who is proud. Don't look at your neighbor. Look at me, okay? How many of you know someone who is proud? They rely on themselves. Pride and self-reliance are other ways we can limit God and his power in our lives. When we trust in our own abilities and resources more than in God, we are essentially limiting what God can do through us. When we depend on, depend on ourselves instead of depending on him. The story of King Nebuchadnezzar in the fourth chapter of Daniel serves as a powerful example of how pride can limit God's work. Nebuchadnezzar was a mighty king who credited his success to his own strength and wisdom. He says, I'm mighty because of me. I am successful because of me. I am all of this because of me. But God humbled him by driving him into madness until he acknowledged God's sovereignty. God caused Nebuchadnezzar to lose his mind because of pride. I'm not saying that proud people are going to lose their minds. God can choose to humble them other ways as well. But Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. Nebuchadnezzar's pride limited his ability to recognize God's hand in his life. And it was only through humbling himself that he could experience God's power and restoration. In Luke 18, 9 through 14, Jesus told the story of a self-righteous Pharisee and a tax collector who were in the temple praying. The Pharisee was full of himself. Like Nebuchadnezzar, he was very proud. The tax collector was humble before God, and he acknowledged his sin. The Pharisee's prideful attitude blinded him to his need for grace, while the tax collector's humility opened the door for God's mercy to flow in. Jesus concludes the parable by saying, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Pride limits our ability to receive God's grace because it creates a false sense of self-sufficiency. Pride creates a false sense of self-sufficiency. Pride and self-reliance keep us from seeking God's help and guidance. There's very little room for God to work when we are full of ourselves. Think about that. There's very little room for God to do things in our lives when we are full of ourselves. The Bible calls us to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand so that he may lift us up at the appointed time. See 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. A true event happened a number of years ago. A small airplane took off by itself without a pilot. Somehow it had been left in gear 
and it just taxied down the runway and took off. This is a true story. It went 90 miles and then crashed. It took off on its own, flew for 90 miles, and then something happened and it hit the earth. Without God, you can take off for a while. Without God, you can go high for a while. Without God, you can get your own name for a while. Or you can build something that is great for a while. But there's coming a time when you're going to run out of fuel. When you run out of fuel, that landing is going to be hard. So before you take off, make sure God is in charge. Before you take off, make sure God is calling the shots. Before you take off, make sure you have submitted to God so that when you take off, you keep flying and do not crash. Psalms 127 verse 1 reads, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Unless God is in control, it's for nothing. This stretches into your personal life, your academic life, whatever area that is important to you. If God is not in control, it is for nothing. It will come to nothing the way this world will come to nothing. Because this world is going to be burnt up. This world is going to be recreated. I just think of so many people who put so much effort into earth-based things, earth-based efforts, and this earth is going to be washed away. So number five, neglecting prayer and communion with God is another thing that can limit God's power in your life. When I was putting this PowerPoint together, Aaliyah came over my shoulder and she saw that picture and she started copying what she saw in the picture. She also put her hands out like you see in the picture. And this, and this spoke to me. If she sees me praying, she's going to pray. If I'm neglecting prayer, she's going to do what she sees, and she's also going to neglect prayer. Is prayer something that is regular in your life? By the way, this coming um, term, I'm going to be doing a four-part sermon series on prayer. The right ways to pray, the wrong ways to pray, the prayers that God does not hear, and, and many more exciting things. And we're going to get into this into much greater detail. But neglecting prayer and communion with God is another way to limit God's power in your life. There's a term in the legal world called the power of attorney. It's a legal term, it's a legal right that allows someone else to sign on your behalf. Someone else to sign a document on your behalf. When Benji was born, he got his passport when he was at least almost a month old. So he could not write his name at that point. I had to sign for him. Aaliyah as well. She got her passport when she was maybe three months old. I had to sign for her. They can write their names now, but at the time they couldn't. I had to sign on their behalf. That's exactly what happens when you pray. When Christians pray, our Father, the Holy Spirit delivers our prayer to the Father. God before he responds, he looks over to Jesus and asks, him, asks Jesus if he's signing the note. God says, okay, Jesus, should I answer this person's request based on your authority? Jesus is our power of eternity. He is the one who signs off our prayers if we are in relationship with him. If you're not in relationship with him, you can pray. But if you're not in relationship with him, What's going to happen? Does God listen to the prayers of unsaved people? That's another subject for another day. John chapter 16, verse 24. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. If I put a million dollars in your physical bank account, you are a guaranteed millionaire. But if you do not know how to write a check, that which is guaranteed cannot be enjoyed. Too many of us who've too many of us who've got bank accounts full of God, we've got bank accounts full of God's blessings are forgetting to sign our checks. We forget to draw from the spiritual reservoir or we don't understand how to draw from what the spirit from that spiritual reservoir. We live an unsuccessful Christian life. It's through prayer when we are in right relationship with God something I've made it a mission to do every sermon 
is to talk about what it means to be saved. Being saved, I've, I've already done this already today, but being saved means repenting of your sins, turning from your sins and putting your full trust in Jesus Christ. That is something that has to be repeated every Sunday service for every single person. We can pray, but if we're praying to a God that we're not in relationship with, nothing's going to happen. Prayer is a vital way for believers to connect with God and neglecting this communion can limit the flow of God's wisdom, strength, and blessings in our lives. Though he was the son of God, Jesus frequently took time to get away and pray. Even Jesus got away to pray. He demonstrated the importance of maintaining a close relationship with the Father. In John chapter 15 verse 5, Jesus teaches, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Neglecting prayer and communion with God serves, severs this vital connection, limiting the spiritual fruitfulness that could be in our life. No prayer in your life, no power in your life. The early church provides a model of how, to pray, how, of how prayer unleashes God's power. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it highlights that the believers devoted themselves to prayer, not to a man of God. They devoted themselves to prayer, not to a miracle. They devoted themselves to prayer, not to the prophecies of a prophet. They devoted themselves to prayer, and as a result, they witnessed the, churches, the, the church have signs and wonders and rapid growth. Prayer was the lifeblood of their community, enabling them to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we neglect prayer, we limit our spiritual vitality and effectiveness. We forfeit the opportunity to seek God's guidance and strength by neglecting prayer. Prayer is not just a religious duty, but a vital connection that empowers us to live out God's will. Without it, we are like a branch that's been severed from the vine. And what happens to a branch that has been cut off from a tree or from a plant? It dies. Number six, worldliness can limit God's power in our life. Worldliness and idolatry. How many of you like potato crisps? How many of you like potato crisps? Okay. How many of you have bought those small bag of potato crisps? Okay. How many of you have found that there's a lot more air than crisps in those bags sometimes, you know? You're being cheated. We're being cheated, you know? There's, you have these small bags of potato crisps thinking you're going to get a full bag of crisps. You open it, you find more air than crisps. Potato crisps these days are about one-fourth crisps and three-fourths air. The potato crisps companies can say it's a bag, call it a bag, and advertise it as a bag of crisps. But if you pay for a bag, you will get much less than what you bargained for. We have too many potato crisp Christians today. There's too many Christians who are half saved and half worldly. And if you open them up, you're going to find a lot of air. Okay? There are Christians today that are like those bags of potato crisps. You open them up, you don't see much God in there, but you do see a lot of air. You see half saved, half, half of the world in them. In John chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, it reads, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Don't be a potato crisp Christian where there's half of the world in you and the other half is God. Either God is God of everything or he isn't God of anything. He's either God of all or he isn't God at all. God is not going to share you with the world. He wants all of you. James 4.4, adulterers and adulteries, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Worldliness and idolatry, idolatry is the worship of, of physical things, can also limit God's work in our lives when our hearts are set on material things or when we elevate anything above God, we are violating the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We restrict his ability to operate fully in our lives. You know what? All sorts of things can become idols in your life. Your cell phone can become an idol. 
Okay, your boyfriend, your girlfriend can become an idol. You know what? Ministry can become an idol. When you value ministry for God instead of valuing the God who you are ministering for. The story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 16 verse 22 illustrates how the love of wealth can limit one's relationship with God. When Jesus tells him, the rich young ruler, to sell his possessions and follow him, the young man goes away because he cannot part with his wealth. His wealth was the idol in his life. His attachment to material things limited his, limited his ability to fully follow Jesus and experience the life that Jesus offered. When you read the story, Jesus was saying, sell all you have and become one of my followers. And it's always hit my mind. I've always started thinking, this man... He could have been disciple number 13. We will never know. This man, he could have written one of the books of the Bible. We will never know. This man could have been one of the traveling companions of the Apostle Paul. We will never know. This man could have started one of the churches in the early church in the book of Acts. We will never know. Because worldliness was more important to him than godliness. His materials were more important to him than a walk with Jesus Christ. There's potential that will never be realized if you go to your grave without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do you want to know the wealthiest place in the world? The wealthiest place is the graveyard. The people who died outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ and never fully walking into God's purpose for their life and their dreams were unrealized. The Old Testament is filled with accounts of Israel struggles with idolatry. Whenever the Israelites turned to idols, they limited God's protection and blessing, often resulting in their downfall. In Jeremiah 2 verse 13, God says, My people have, com have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that, cannot hold, that, that, can, that can hold no water. Ultimately, idolatry led to the Israelites, the Israelites away from the true source of life, limiting their spiritual strength. Worldliness and idolatry divert our attention and affection away from God, leading to spiritual dryness and a lack of fulfillment. I'm not saying you can't have things in this life, but don't let things have you. Be under the control of God, not under the control of things that are going to pass away. When we place anything above God, whether it's wealth, status, or even relationships, we limit his work in our lives. The Bible calls us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he promises that all other things will be added unto us in Mark chapter 6, verse 33. You cannot mix unleaded fuel with diesel fuel. There are two types of fuel out there, unleaded and, and, and diesel. You cannot mix unleaded fuel and diesel fuel and still think that you're going somewhere. The moment you introduce diesel and unleaded into the same unleaded only engine, you have canceled the, uh, the effects of the unleaded by the fact of diesel. Just because it looks like gas does not mean it's going to help you. What we do as Christians is we come to church to get unleaded fuel. And then we go into the world to get diesel and wonder why our engine is unhealthy. If you mix fuel in an engine, that engine is going to make noise. That engine is going to be unhealthy. If you want to mix godliness with worldliness, your spiritual engine is going to be unhealthy as well. And then finally, number seven. The seventh thing that limits God's power in our life is unforgiveness and bitterness. A lady was walking her dog, and the dog was trying to get away from the chain leash. But every time the dog pulled away, the lady yanked it back, pulling the dog back to herself. And the animal couldn't get free. The chain le leash held the dog hostage, kept it bound, and unable to break away. He couldn't break the chain. Many of us today find ourselves held hostage by a chain leash. And the links in the chain are many. There is the link of anger, the link of bitterness, the link of resentment, the link of revenge. But no matter how many links are in the chain, they all boil down to the same thing, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. 
Unforgiveness and bitterness are toxic attitudes that can limit our, ex our experience of God's grace and hinder our relationship with others. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant, where a servant who was forgiven a massive debt by his master refuses to forgive a fellow servant of a much smaller debt. The master then revokes his forgiveness, and the unforgiving servant is handed over to tormentors. Jesus concludes by saying, that this, saying this is how the heavenly father will treat those who do not forgive others from their heart. Unforgiveness limits our ability to receive God's forgiveness and grace. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 reads, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness not only affects our spiritual health, but also poisons our relationship with others. You don't want to be around a bitter person all the time. They're not fun to be around. It limits God's ability to bring healing and reconciliation, as bitterness often leads to more conflict and division. Unforgiveness and bitterness create a barrier between us and God. They keep us trapped in the past, unable to move forward into the future that God wants us to live in. The Bible teaches us that we should forgive others as God has forgiven us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 32. And in doing so, we open the door for God's healing and his power to restore our lives. And God will deal with the other person in his way, in his time. The Bible shows us that while God's power is limitless, our attitudes and actions can limit how we experience his work in our lives. This goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. God is without limit. He is limitless, but the effectiveness of his power can be limited in our lives if we maintain the things that I've been talking about. Unbelief, disobedience, fear, pride, neglecting prayer, worldliness, and unforgiveness are all ways in which we can place barriers between ourselves and God. His power on its own is unaffected, but the effectiveness of that power in our lives is limited and sometimes just will not exist if we maintain these things. These limitations are not about diminishing God's power, but about restricting our own access to the fullness of his blessings and guidance. To avoid these limitations, the Bible encourages us to cultivate faith, grow faith in God, obedience to his commands, humility, and a close relationship with God through prayer. By doing so, we, are, we align ourselves with God's will and open the door for him to work powerfully in us and through us. The challenge for every believer is to recognize and remove these limitations to allow God to truly have a powerful work in our life. And I'll close with this story. The story is of a guy who went to chop, who, who went to chop down trees. He used an ax to do the work. So he was able to chop down a few trees every day. But then one day, he found out about a power chainsaw, about electric chainsaws. The salesman told the guy, well, look, with this power saw, you can chop down 50 more trees than you can chop now with your own efforts. The guy was quickly sold, and he purchased the electric chainsaw. He went home and immediately tried the saw. The next day, he went to the store where he bought the power saw, and he threw it in front of the counter, and he said, man, you sold me a piece of rubbish. What do you mean a piece of rubbish, the salesman said. I use this thing. I would normally chop down four or five trees a day. I use this thing and I didn't even get one tree finished. And the salesman said, what? I didn't get one finished, not one. This thing is junk. The salesman looked puzzled, asked to take a look at the equipment. The guy handed it to him and the salesman took and pulled the cord, vroom, went the chainsaw. The guy who purchased the saw was surprised and he says, eh, eh, chino chichi, what is this? What's that noise? He had purchased the saw and had taken it home, not understanding what he had. He never turned it on. He didn't know what type of power was available to him because he didn't know how to work the machine. In the same way, most Christians don't understand what they have in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit until it's properly understood 
and properly used. Thank you for joining us. We pray that you have been blessed. Join us in fellowship every Sunday 10 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. on Musajalumba Road next to Eagles Nest Secondary School as we celebrate Jesus, our risen King. You can also check us out on Facebook at Elam Evangelistic Church and on YouTube. God bless you.